A nucleotide is a monomer. A monomer is a single unit that when put together in a chain creates a larger molecule, in this case DNA or RNA. Each of the units is composed of different combinations of atoms. In the case of a nucleotide, the monomer is made up of three basic components that becomes really important to the functioning of DNA. The nitrogenous base, the pentose sugar, and the phosphate. Together, they form a single molecule of DNA. The backbone being the, the, the two and three, or the pentose, sugar, and phosphate. And two of these molecules together form the, the characteristic double helix, and, high, and they're held together, the two molecules are held together by hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases. Let's take a closer look at this monomer, at this nucleotide. As we look at the nucleotide a little closer, we see that the nitrogenous base is actually composed of, a carb of carbon rings and can either be one or two rings. One or two rings, in this case it's two. Notice there's two rings here. And being the word, the nitrogenous lets you know that it has nitrogen in it. So, it's, and of course, the base just means that it acts as a base, a chemical base. So, you have one or two rings, you have nitrogen in it, and it acts as a base. Hence, it's a nitrogenous base. And it sticks off the side of this carbon at the one position. Remember, the, no, the nomenclature for carbon rings starts from the oxygen moves in a clockwise direction and is counted one, two, three, etc. for each of the carbons in the ring. The phosphate comes from our functional groups that we've had to memorize. It contains one phosphorus, one phosphorus atom at its center surrounded by three oxygens. Normally the phosphate is designated in, in a lot of shorthand notations is a, phosph a P with a circle around it, and it's kind of designated as, as people understanding that when you see this symbol, it has a phosphorus in the center and three oxygens surrounding it. Also notice that the phosphate is charged, making the nucleotide a charged, uh, a charged particle, meaning that the, water, the DNA is then soluble in water. The sugar is deoxy is, excuse me, is ribose, Ribose just means that it's a five carbon, a five carbon sugar. It is a penta, it's a pen, it's a pentose. In other words, it's the shape of a pentagon, right? Five sides. And it has the oxygen at the second carbon. That's the two prime carbon has the oxygen. So we call it ribose. When it's missing the oxygen, we call it deoxyribose. So that's pretty much a nucleotide. And this unit together, this whole unit is, is the monomer for DNA. or RNA, but it's this unit, RNA when it's ribose and DNA when it's deoxyribose. This unit put together in phosphodiester bonds from phosphate to sugar, phosphate to sugar, bonded covalently, creates the backbone of DNA. Now if we take a look at these nitrogenous bases, these units, these monomers that we call nucleotides, and remember, when we're talking about these nucleotides, it's pretty clear that we're talking about a group, uh, a grouping of atoms that create these units that when put together, they become this long polymer. Now, in the case of the nucleotide, we're talking about the phosphate, the sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So we're really talking about this portion. So that would be one, and then there'd be two, and 
So this would be one, and this is two, and this is three, and this is four, and this is five, and then six, etc., from the beginning to end. And the same thing goes on this side. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, in this case, in this example, you have six nucleotides all linked together into two molecules that are then hydrogen bonded to each other in the center. So you see the center is held together by hydrogen bonds between the two nitrogenous bases in the center. So in this case, it's G and C having the three hydrogen, the three hydrogen bonds, this C and G having a second three hydrogen bonds, the A and T having a, only two hydrogen bonds, etc. All the way up, these hydrogen bonds keep these molecules of DNA together. The nitrogenous bases, again, remember we said they have some of these have two rings, that's one and two, or, and some have only one ring. Here's one, here's one, here's two rings. The two ring structures are guanine and adenine, and the single ring structures are cytosine and thymine. Purines are another word, another name, a category of nitrogenous bases that have two rings. Pyrimidines are a grouping of nitrogen spaces that have only one ring. So what's an important concept here? Well, one important concept is these hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides, between the nitrogen spaces, are weak compared to the covalent bonds. That's important because it allows the molecule, the double helix, that all of you are familiar with, that's created by the pulling and pushing of all the charges and different molecules, different components of the molecules, into this, into this spiral staircase, that they were able to open it up, to unzip it, if you will, by reducing the, or changing the conditions that would allow for these bonds to be broken because they're weak. Those same conditions won't allow the covalent bonds that are holding the backbone together, or even the nitrogenous base to the sugar, these are not broken because their covalent bonds and hydrogen bonds are inherently weaker than covalent bonds. So when you're looking at your models and you're creating that, that three-dimensional structure, you'll notice that this is pretty much what you have, except you have your bases and your sugars and your phosphates are a little bigger and the origami instructions are going to allow you to create the double helix in a three-dimensional way. If we take a look at this picture and we think of ourselves as someone who has never seen a bunny rabbit, perhaps an alien on another planet that got this transmission through some kind of radio signal, and we looked at all these bunny rabbits and we asked ourselves, where is the meaning in all this? We wouldn't look for all the bunny rabbits that were all the same. There's no meaning in this. All these bunny rabbits being the same, there's no meaning in it. And there's no meaning here. It's the place where there's a difference that makes, that gives us all the information that we need in order to decipher meaning among sameness. So information comes from differences, differences in signals. So here in this, in this cluster of spirally things of galaxies throughout some part of the universe, it's these tiny little circles. It's, these, it's the difference between this galaxy and this bigger galaxy and the wider spiral and the tiniest little spiral over here and this double spiral over here. It's these differences that give us so much information that it would take us a long time to decipher exactly what information we have that's in, in front of us. So the more differences there are, the more information we can find. When we look at the language of machines, the language of our computers, it's, it's really just simply the difference between it being on or off, or the difference between it being a zero or a one. And this difference and the number of differences and the sequence of differences all give us this information that we that allow us to do the things that I'm doing right now on the screen, or that allow us to have things like computers and internet. 
Now we're all used to this kind of information and the sets of zeros and ones in computer language or machine language and hieroglyphics that where we have pictures on the walls that give us information or symbols like runes or or even our own letters in our alphabet. But it doesn't have to be limited to that. It's not necessarily limited to that. Here in this in these Incan beads, and I think in class I said they were Mayan, but they're actually Incan. Here in these beads and the knots that form these beads form information. It's the differences in the knots and their structure, where they are, their sizes, their colors. They all give information to someone who could read this. Unfortunately, we've only been able to decipher the, the, uh, the number system, but there is a whole book here, maybe a whole history of a human being or their family. Usually, it seems that the only ones that have survived uh, over, the eon, or the, over the ages has been those found in Incan burial sites. So this might actually be the story of a human being, their whole life story from beginning to end, all contained within a series of dots. Of knots, excuse me. So information comes from differences. Information comes from a, si a way of being able to read the differences in some kind of pattern. So what better way of containing a great deal of information than to have the information written in something the size of a molecule that can be wound up and wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up into something that we call a chromosome. And then each person can have 23 pairs of these chromosomes in each and every cell, allowing then the cell to have incredible amount of information and information that's contained within the differences inside these base pairs one sequence bonding with the other sequence, allowing for not only differences, but sequences, a beginning and an end, and a book, if you will, a book of life. So to be clear, the information here is found inside the DNA, inside the very structure that's inside every cell in your body. So every time there's a C, T, T, A, there's a sequence, and the sequence can be a billion nucleotides long. And that amazing sequence on one molecule, the amazing sequence on the other molecule, can give us information, information that can be taken and allow for a cell to grow and become stronger and larger. It can specialize into different functions and can finally create a human being all from this book, this sequence that's not made of knots, not made of letters, the way we have represented here, but made of nucleotides, nitrogenous bases, different nitrogenous bases, one that we call T and G and C and A, but we know they're really about a single ring structure, a double ring structure, or different combinations of atoms but very consistently throughout nature, we find these different nitrogenous bases found in a specific sequence that give humans the information they need to be able to build cells, build tissues, build organs, and finally build an organism. Not just humans, but every living creature on the planet.